All right. Come on in if you can hear my voice. Welcome back. And welcome to our Sunday service here at Maps Global. I want to welcome any new time, first time visitors. If you are new here, go ahead and wave your hand. Go ahead and wave your hand. We've got a card for you. Um, and Bethany will, will pass those out in the team. We just want to welcome you here. Maps Global is a spiritual family that exists to pray, preach, and sing until every nation sees and sings of the worth of Jesus and the Great Commission is finished in our generation. We get to do this. And uh, excited to have you here today on Sunday. Today is Vision Sunday. Yeah. So we're going to be sharing a little bit about what it means to be a part of our global spiritual family here at MAPS Global. So I'm excited for that. It's going to be awesome. But before we get into that, we've got a couple of announcements. First of all, if you have not yet downloaded our app, I want to encourage you to do that. You can scan the code up here uh, and download the app from whatever store you would like to. And on the app, it has announcements every week that come out, some of what we share here on Sundays, but also a lot of other ways to get connected, a lot of other information about what's going on here. So I want to encourage you to download the app. And then if you've already downloaded it, check it because each week there's new stuff on there that you can get connected to. Speaking of something new that will be on the app this week is baby dedication service. Yeah, baby. Yes, we have a lot of kids running around and a lot of new children. And so we want to invite you, if you would like to dedicate your baby, we are going to have a baby dedication service on Sunday, November 13th. So that's just in a couple of weeks. And uh, in the email that's going out this week and in the app, you'll find uh, a way to communicate that you would like to sign up for that and get the information um, for the baby dedication service on November 13th. Secondly, this is, uh, as of this week, it's going to be the 1st of November on Tuesday. Can you believe that? We are in November. It was, uh, I was in the mountains over the weekend and it was 32 degrees this morning. So the first frost, that's crazy. Um, and uh, the first week of every month, we have our first Friday service. Yeah. So first Friday is coming up this Friday. That's on November the 4th. And then following our first Friday service, which just to say a minute on our first Friday service, that's a time where the region comes together to worship together. And so if you have friends and family who want to come in town for a weekend, that's a great time to do that. Um, we'll meet at 7 p.m. on Friday, November 4th. And then following that, every Sunday after our first Friday, we have begun hosting our communion service. Yeah. How many of you guys have enjoyed that? It's been really an incredible time of worship together, of uh, some liturgy, of sharing in the Lord's Supper. And on our communion Sundays, we meet in the chapel, which is just down the hall, past the Welcome Center. And so I want to encourage you to join us for that. It's just about an hour-long service, um, and it's really, really special time. So that is on November the 6th. And then uh, also our prayer room is continuing to be open. And so if you'd like to get connected to our prayer room, we are open Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And this is a prayer room by the city, meaning many different churches, congregations, and believers from the city join us throughout the week to bring their song, to bring their prayers before the Lord. So um, it's by the city, for the city, and to the nations of the earth. And so if you'd like to get connected to our prayer room and during our fall schedule, go ahead and scan that code and it'll take you to some information about the prayer room um, to get connected, take a slot, and uh, we get to sing together to Jesus. It's amazing. Lastly, before I invite Randy up, uh, I want to encourage you, if you have a question or you want to meet a staff member and get more connected, to visit our Welcome Center, which is just down the hall uh, at the end of the service. And there will be a couple folks there who can help you if you have some technical difficulties on getting on the email list or what have you, or you just want to get more connected. Head down to the Welcome Center after the service, and uh, we will see you and meet you there. Okay, with that... 
we have a base update video. And this is coming from you, uh, coming from Eurasia. Uh, so we get to hear from our team in Eurasia some exciting things that are going on. So let's go ahead and hear the base update. Hey everybody, it's Bonnie. I'm coming at you from EMB. I'm super excited to share some stories with you today. We have a lot going on, but I've got just a couple of things I want to share with you. So first, we have had an increase of local worshipers coming into our house of prayer. And what that what I mean is that we've had locals who are just longing to worship the Lord. We have a woman who's been coming around a lot more recently, been involved in the house of prayer. And even when she's at home, she spends hours every day just worshiping the Lord and in times of prayer. And her husband is one of the guys who just did the program. He's one of our students that graduated, um, did the classes, went on the placement and everything. And she's about to also be a student in our upcoming school program that's going to be in the spring. So that's really exciting, first of all. And then um, also we have just some young guys who have been more involved in leading worship. One of these guys has been doing more spontaneous courses, leading on during our Tuesday night Holy Spirit nights and on Sunday mornings as well. And he's just been having these spontaneous courses a couple of those are like burn with fire, you died for me, you are the slain lamb, and it's just coming from his heart, and it's so beautiful to witness and see, and it's just been a personal prayer of ours for so long to see these locals just singing from their heart, so that is just amazing, and we're so excited about that, and he is also planning to do the program as well, so pray for both of these students as they get prepared to do the program, and then on our Tuesday Holy Spirit Nights, we are going to start a new series on the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs, and we are super excited, but when we announced it last night, the locals were cheering, they were so excited. We're not even sure if they've ever had any teaching on this before, but the, the hunger that is in them to learn more about the Lord and the love of the Lord is there, and we really believe that God is going to use this to increase that hunger that they're gonna learn more about loving God with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And it's gonna just be an amazing time for them. So pray for us that also as we do this series, that the love of the Lord would increase in our midst and that we would have greater understanding of the depths of the love of God. So thanks everybody. See you next time. That's awesome. <clears throat> love that girl. All right, guys. Good morning. How are you? You good? Some of you are good. Are you happy to be alive? Let's go. You, like, are you happy to be alive now in this day, in this age? I mean, think about it. You could have been born in 1304. That would have been a different experience. The chairs would not be as comfortable. You would not be in this room. And yet, in the, in the design and destiny of God, you're here. You made it. You woke up this morning. You took a breath. Wow. We get to do this. This is awesome. Nudge your neighbor. Say, I think we get to do this. I think this is, I think we get to do this. It's all right. Well, this morning is uh, Vision Sunday. Vision Sunday. It's the, I think the first one we've done definitely here. I think it's the first one we've done in a while. And I want to give you a little context for why we're doing this and what's going to happen to you in the next few minutes. So... Um, you ready for the, just drink from the fire hose. Um, so we finished our Dove series, the, the series on the Dove last week. That was incredible. We thoroughly enjoy that. And we're not done with the Holy Spirit. We're just giving teaching around how much we're going to pursue him in the days to come. But uh, this Friday, which is first Friday, Chris is going to be launching No Shame November. No Shame November. Let's go. Let's go. No Shame November. We love it. Every November, we take the whole month to talk about how the finished work of the cross and our identity in Jesus has eradicated shame and accusation and fear and guilt and ooh, it's good. So No Shame November starts first Friday. I will be with our Eurasia uh, team preaching at our network conference. So our church in Eurasia uh, and our school and our house of prayer has planted and birthed or adopted. We're at like four churches now, I think. 
And so they gather once a year together and I'm gonna fly in on Friday, preach three sessions and then leave back on Sunday. So it's gonna be awesome. Yeah, we get to do this, let's go. So <clears throat> that's awesome. Uh, so Chris is gonna launch No Shame November. And then at the end of November, the last Sunday in November, I believe we are gonna begin Advent. Advent is like a month away, guys. This is crazy. And so for those of you that are newer around here, Maps Global Family observes Advent. We take the whole Advent season. We read through uh, every day. We do the scripture readings in the prayer room. And on Sundays, we're going to light the candles. This room is going to look a lot different. Uh, and my wife's going to do a great job at decorating. You're going to see a lots of, uh, we just love it. We love slowing down and observing Advent. So we'll go through Advent, and then January, the new year, our preaching team has decided, this is really exciting, to go back. We've done this once before, but it was three or four years ago. January 2023, we're going to start our series, restart our series, or begin our series again on preaching through the Sermon on the Mount, line by line. Yes, so that's going to be, let's go, we get to do this. So we're going to be with Jesus on the mountain for last time we preached through the Sermon on the Mount line by line, it took us almost a year to do, and it was unbelievable. So we're going to start that in 2023, and that's going to be incredible. So in between that, I had a Sunday here where I went, you know what? There's a lot of people coming and going. There's a lot of new people that, uh, new families, new uh, men and women that have kind of jumped into what we're doing here, especially in our move up to Moss Side. And so I wanted to take a Sunday before we get into all of that and talk about what is this thing and what can you expect by being here, who we are, why we exist, What's going on? Is it a house of prayer? Is it a church? Is it a missions organization? Is it in Richmond? Is it in Eurasia? Is it in the Middle East? Where is it? And the answer is yes, 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 and yes. And so I wanted to give some context for what we do, who we are, and then I have five asks for you. So get your notebooks out, whatever you need to do, write these down, because these are real asks. These are not suggestions. These are like, I, as the pastor of this and the father of the spiritual family, I'm asking you for these five things. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about who we are, why we exist, what we do, and then I have five asks for you to prayerfully consider. All right, you ready to dive in? I got slides for you today. This is going to be great. Yeah, I'm going to show you pictures, and it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be beautiful. And we got two projectors now, which is a sign and a wonder. It's going to be great. <clears throat> Okay, so let's pray together and we'll dive in. Father, we come before you. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you that you're already ministering and moving in the room. Lord, that you're healing bodies. You're restoring destinies. You're imparting courage for men and women to walk on their destiny track. And Lord, I bless that. And Lord, now I ask you as we spend the next few moments talking about what you've called this spiritual family to, I ask you, this has been my prayer for the last 24 hours. Lord, awaken DNA, spiritual DNA. Lord, let those, those things that you've placed deep inside the hearts of men and women, let them come alive, let them burn. Lord, I ask you for that, that Luke 24, that our hearts would burn within us as we consider what you've spoken and where you're leading us. Lord, for those that, um, that are asking, what is, what is my place? What is my part? What, what are you calling me to do? Lord, I ask you for the lightning of clarity to come into the room this morning, <clears throat> and that you would set us, Lord, speak to us. We honor your voice in our midst, and we ask you to thunder from heaven, thunder from heaven, Lord, as we consider your worth in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, you guys ready? Yep. Awesome. Let's do this. Well, Maps Global is a family, it's a, it's a multi-generational, it's a multi-geographic family. Our family is spread across right now four different locations here in Richmond, the Levant, the Middle East, and Eurasia. Those are, we use those terms, by the way, because we can't say the actual countries we work in for security reasons. So if you ever wonder why we say Eurasia instead of blank, it's because we want our guys to keep having residency there, <laughs> that's why. And so we use, regional terms for where we're working. Although if you wanna find out the specific countries, you can talk to one of our guys and we'll let you know. But from publicly and from stage, especially because we live stream, we wanna be very careful. But we are a multi-geographic family, multinational family. We're a multi-ethnic family. Our family, our spiritual family is made up of people that are from America, from Turkey, from 
Iraq, from Jordan, from Africa, from where else are we from? We're from everywhere. What, Jordan? Yeah, I said that. Where else? Egypt? Yeah, the Egyptians. Koreans. We love it. We are a rainbow. We are a rainbow family, and we love that. Pittsburgh. (laughs) Alabama. (laughs) Okay, okay. The Ohio had to get in there. I've, I, no, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to chase that rabbit. Okay. And so multi-generational or multi-ethnic, we're multi-geographic and we're a family and we are bound together in a common cause. And, and Luke said this, he, he, he just kind of said it when he was doing the announcements is because we bleed this. We exist to pray, preach, and sing, pray, preach, and sing in the most unreached areas of the earth until, and there is an until for us. This is not just, we hope something happens. We are convinced that every ethnos is gonna see and sing of the worth of Jesus. This thing's got a, a finish line and we, are, we wanna partner with Jesus to get to that finish line. And the Great Commission's fulfilled in our generation. Now, we as a leadership team and as a staff and as a family, there's lots of things, everything we do we love. That's, that's important. We don't do anything we hate to do. But, but we don't show up in the room because of what we do. There's something deeper that we're anchored to because what we do can evolve. Sometimes what we do is hard. I mean, Frontier Missions is hard. Um, I mean, I'll just, just let you into a little, little bit of my weekend and so, so you can pray. The leaders of our Middle East mission space, their daughters, they had to rush their daughter to the hospital this weekend. She was having seizures. They couldn't figure it out. We're trying to figure out how to help them. And they got her stabilized. Now they got to do the work to figure out what's causing the seizures. I mean, this is happening all, you know, 3,000 miles away. Frontier missions can be hard. So pray for them. Pray for that family. My point is saying we don't show up primarily because of what we do. There's something deeper that we're anchored to, and it's why we do it. So Mass Global, this family has three whys. And uh, <clears throat> there are anchors. And when we, when we as a leadership team said, okay, we, we've got to get deeper than how we do things and what we do, it's why we do it. We had to anchor to three things that we were sure would never change. You don't want to anchor your life to something that's going to change. Right? How many of you have been around long enough to know how you do church changes? How many know, have been around long enough to know what church you go to changes? So if you just anchor to, I like this kind of church, you're setting yourself up for some discouragement, disillusionment. <clears throat> you got to anchor. How many of you know that seasons in your life change? I mean, you know friendship circles change. Is it true? Say what? Assignments change. Have you been alive long enough to know that it's not just one assignment, there's many assignments inside your calling? And so we got to anchor to something deeper than just my assignment or the friends I'm around or what I like to do. We've got to anchor something that is unchanging. And when we went before the Lord together as a leadership team and said, Lord, give us three things that will never change that we can anchor to. No matter if I wake up and, and you know, it's allergy season or if I wake up and I'm feeling good. I wake up and I'm tired, or if I wake up and I'm feeling anointed one day or not, I know that this will never change. I can get up and it's because of this that I go into that prayer room or fly to Eurasia to preach for 24 hours and come back. Why am I doing that? And the first why, the first anchor, the first rock we put our anchor into is that Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy. That will never change. In fact, we are going to be increasingly discovering how much he's worth forever. He will never get less worthy. We will only discover more and more how worthy he is. And his worth transcends just what he's done for me. His worth is connected to the fact that he created all things. By him, all things exist. Maps is not Randy's. Maps is not Randy's or Randy's and Luke's. and Maps is the Lord's. He spoke it into existence like he spoke all things into existence. 
And it's not for Randy's personal platform. Maps is for the Lord and his glory. There will be a day when Randy won't lead maps. I don't know if it's in a week or 10 years. I don't know. It could be. I don't know. Who knows? That's why we develop leaders, because there's a day when Randy won't lead maps. I hope that we've built something that will last beyond Randy. My God. Not that impressive. (laughs) Help us, Lord. It exists to give Jesus what he's worth. It exists for the glory of his name in this neighborhood and in the nations of the earth. Maps exist because Jesus is worthy. It will never change. And that worth, the worth of Jesus, worth is a cost statement. When you say, Jesus, you're worthy, the question is, well, what is he worthy of? We can just say you're worthy and move on. Worthy costs something. Holy can be admired, but worthy costs something. It means you're worth something. You, I've done the math. I've done the evaluation. And Jesus and his glory and his presence are worth more than everything else. Life and family and home and riches and wealth and comfort. It's worth more. And so if I ever have to be in a situation where I have to give up one for this, I will joyfully do it because Jesus is worthy. If he says to me, leave the comfort of your home or your culture because I have an assignment for you among the unreached, Jesus is worthy of that. If he asked me to serve the poor in the city at the cost of my own inconvenience and my own uh, personal finances, Jesus is worthy of that. If he asked me to pick up an assignment and step into leadership and embrace that sacrifice, Jesus is worthy of that. So Maps Global exists because Jesus is worthy. Number two, the second anchor is that the gospel is powerful. The gospel is powerful. In fact, you can't exaggerate how powerful the gospel is. There's, I've done this test, and somebody can find it. I, I invite you. You can't find one superlative to put in front of powerful that exaggerates the gospel. Try it just for a second. Think of it. You know what a superlative is? An adjective? Is it infinitely powerful? Yes. Will it ever lose its power? No. Is it magnificently powerful? Yes. Is it extremely powerful? Yes. It's the only news that has the power to change an eternal destiny. Paul said in Romans 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. It's the only news that doesn't need to be spoken eloquently to be transformative. It can come through the lips of an eight-year-old or through the writings of an 80-year-old. Paul said, I didn't come to you with eloquent speech, lofty speech. I only knew Christ and him crucified among you. The gospel is powerful and it is our conviction that the gospel is the loudest thing the world should hear from the church. Prophetic mandates don't save. They're important, but they don't save. Social preferences don't save. Political opinions don't save. They're important, but they don't save. And if the world has to get through our social opinions, our political opinions, our social preferences, and our prophetic mandates to finally get to the gospel, something's backwards. I'm getting getting stirred up. Me too. too. This is Vision Sunday. The gospel is powerful. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter what society you grew up in. Doesn't matter if your family is ethnically Muslim or Buddhist or humanist. 
or ethnically Christian, the gospel still saves. <laughs> and because Jesus is worthy, because the gospel is magnificently powerful, then number three, then it means the time is urgent. We live with an urgency in this family. Now I'm gonna be careful because some of you have been in ministry cultures that weaponized urgency. It was an urgency that was presented to you in order to get you to do more quicker and it produced a frenzied anxiety and busyness and that's not the urgency we're talking about. I abhor that kind of urgency. The urgency that we're talking about is that in light of the worth of Jesus, in light of the power, power of the gospel, I urgently want to live my life for something that matters. I urgently want to disciple a spiritual family that is given to things that matter for eternity. I urgently don't want you to waste your life. I urgently don't want you to build your whole life around financial security. Is that wrong? No. But I'm urgently, I urgently, this is in our preaching, this is in our discipleship, in our development, urgently want to plead with you to give yourself to something that matters for eternity. Something you won't regret at the judgment seat. It's my opinion that many of the things that we in the West are pursuing in the name of Jesus, we will regret at the judgment seat. Fame, influence, popularity, wealth. When we see his worth, we'll go, oh my gosh. We live with an urgency to see the gospel touch the neighborhoods and nations of the earth with an urgency. That urgency causes me to rest so that I can, so I don't blow out, so I don't burn out, so I don't break my body prematurely. That urgency causes me to go home and disconnect from work and spend time with my kids because my kids and the discipleship of my children unto them walking in their calling is, worth, is gonna be worth something in eternity. How well I played the guitar on stage might not, but my children walking in their calling will. This is what I'm talking about. This is the kind of urgency I'm talking about. I can feel you wrestling with it, so I just wanna be clear. It's not a frenzied business trying to whip everybody up into doing more. It's a sobriety that causes us to prioritize our lives. So that's the three whys we're anchored in. This is why I showed up this morning. I'm not gonna lie, the bouncy houses took me out yesterday at the fall festival. I was feeling it. I woke up this morning, oh God. Jesus is worthy, the gospel is powerful. The time is urgent. It's who we are. Now, because of that, or in light of that, what do we do? And I wanna tell you this, because I wanna give each and every one of you the dignity of saying yes to this. You see, many times we bring people, we, we, we create programs to kind of attract people and they come in, but then we don't, we're not clear about what they're actually saying yes to. And so they kind of stick around, well, I like it here, but I'm not sure what I'm saying yes to, and then, and then we don't create healthy on-ramps for them to leave, and then it gets really kind of squirrely. I wanna say this to you so that you know what you're saying yes to when you show up at MAPS, when you come into the prayer room, when you say, you know what, I think, I think God's planning me in that spiritual family. I want you to know what you're saying yes to. I want you to have the dignity to say yes or the dignity to say no. There's been numbers of conversations I've had over the year where people come in and say, yeah, I like that and that, but you know, I'm really feeling this and I really wanna focus on, can you do this because we like it? And I go, no, that's not what we do. There's a thousand, there's a thousand incredible churches in Richmond. I mean, I know pastors all over the city, they're incredible. 
men of God. They are running in their lane. They are discipling people. They are making an impact on the city. I say, I think that church would be really good for you. I have no problem saying that. I'm not after just getting as many people into the seats as possible. I'm about building a missional family where everyone is pulling the same direction. So that, that's why a bit of why we're doing Vision Sunday because I wanna give you the dignity to go, you know what, yes, or no, and no is okay. There's incredible churches in this city that you might come in and go, yes, that's it. And that means it's your family, go for it. So here's, I'm giving you six. We have five what's, but I'm, I'm adding a six one. I'm not adding a what for all the staff. Just don't go. <laughs> These things are like sacred to us. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, he added a what? What are we gonna do? No, I'm just, I'm, there's an addendum. There's a six one I'm throwing out there. This is, number one, what do we do here? What is this place? 31 Moss Side, the beautiful campus, 3121 Moss Side Avenue. What is this room about? What is, head, we call this headquarters. What is headquarters about? What are we doing here? Why, why, what are we giving ourselves to? Well, number one, this place, this building, this room is about unceasing worship. Unceasing worship. It's what we do here. God has spoken, I believe with all my heart, that God has spoken that there is to be a lampstand of or an unceasing expression of worship in this city, Richmond, Virginia. This building, this room, the move up to Moss Side was a sign that God is establishing this lampstand. And what we're building here, we're aiming to build at our bases across the 1040 window. And here is our our building strategy. Here's at the preeminent kind of philosophy on how are you building? On earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. That was Jesus taught us to pray that way. That's God's eternal will to reconcile all things together in heaven and earth. Church is supposed to be a reflection of a culture of heaven. Church is the gathering of, of a heavenly people. And so we build on earth as it is in heaven. That means more than just a power dynamic in meetings, which I love. We want more of that, right? We want people to get healed. We want people to encounter God. But it means a rhythm in a culture. Heaven has a rhythm to it. Heaven has a culture to it. The first thing about heaven, the culture of heaven, is that it's God-centered, God is at the middle. Everything in the heavenly reality, reality revolves around the person of God and the Lamb of God at his right hand and the seven burning fires, the Holy Spirit around him. God is at the center of everything that happens in the heavenly reality. Therefore, God should be at the center of everything we do in church, presence-centered. Church is not primarily people-centered, it's presence-centered. Our conviction is that if you get more presence, people are ministered to. It doesn't mean we don't disciple people, it means that is the outflow of being presence-centered. God is changing right now around the earth the expression of what church looks like. I believe in 10, 20 years, you're gonna see these lampstands of presence-centered communities that are in a rhythm together. It's not just a few leaders, it's a family that has decided we're gonna design the way we live around God. We're gonna talk to him. We're gonna worship when the church becomes increasingly presence-centered, what's gonna happen is it's gonna become increasingly open for more than two hours on a Sunday. Because heaven goes night and day. God wants to replicate that culture on earth and in our churches. Heaven goes night and day. Church, the Holy Spirit is gonna insist in the days to come 
that church is not centered on a personality of a person, a personality, a man or a woman, or a social mandate. It will be centered on the man, Jesus Christ. And when that shift begins to take place, Sunday morning programs will begin to evolve into spiritual families that host his presence night and day. That's what we're building here. It's weak, it's at the beginning. It's infant, it's not as infant as it used to be, but it's not where it's going. Talk about Vision Sunday, where we're going. We believe, we're building with the conviction that God has released grace in this city to be a city that never stops singing. To be a people in the city that are in constant conversation with God about the name of this city. I believe God's inviting church, the church of cities around the earth to begin to get into a conversation with him about the name of their city, about what happens in their city. They stand like watchmen, Isaiah 62, on the wall of their city and go, we actually wanna take responsibility for what takes place at 3 a.m. in our city. We wanna take responsibility for the fact, for, the, for poverty in the city, which means intercession and acts of obedience. Those are not separated from each other. Jesus is inviting churches around the earth to start getting into a conversation with him right now about the changing of the name and the culture of their cities. He wants to repair cities. And he's gonna start by raising up a people who give him no rest night and day. Now, because we're building that kind of culture here, a perpetual song, a constant conversation with heaven among a people, that means that among all the kingdom assignments that are in this family, and there's, there's many of them, there's a manifold of assignments. There's home builders, talking about co- not just contractors, but moms and dads, homemakers, home builders. I'm talking about governmental leaders. I'm talking about people in education the, uh, arena. I'm talking about people that have assignments in the marketplace. And because of the, the nature of what we're building, there will be people whose jobs are to build the infrastructure around the rhythm here. Singers and musicians as legitimate vocations. Manifold of assignments, but one ministry together. Manifold of assignments, but one desire together to host the presence of God and to minister to him night and day. So that people from around this city, around this region, and beloved, around the nations of the earth, we're entering into a season where people are flying here from across the world to sit in this prayer room. People are flying here from Southeast Asia in the Middle East, in South Africa, in Europe, just to be in this room because they heard they could meet with the living God here. This is 100% true. We don't platform that from stage, but I'm telling you, the culture and the rhythm that's being built here, the atmosphere that's being cultivated in this place, people are starting to take their family vacations so a little while back ago, this, the, this family came in with the kids and sat in our prayer room. They were there for a week. I said, what are you doing? Well, we live in Florida, but we heard about maps and we took our, our kids' spring break to come up here and be in this prayer room. Why? Because of presence. Not because of Randy. Because of presence. This headquarters, this campus is about unceasing worship. All of us together being a part of a perpetual song in a litur geo, the rhythm of life, the priestly rhythm of life. This won't just be our church, it's gonna be a collaboration of multiple ministries and churches and expressions and ethnicities around this city, but God has given us the keys to open the doors and host it. I remember meeting with my good friend Don Coleman, who's a pastor in town, early on, and I said, I said okay, we're gonna really give ourselves to building the, building the prayer room And I said, but just so you know, Don, we're gonna build a church family too. Is that okay? He said, is that okay? He said, do it. He goes, build the church. He goes, when I step into that prayer room, I feel like it's my prayer room too. 
He said, that prayer room's the city's prayer room. You build your church. I said, I love this guy. So number one, unceasing worship. Number two, what this camp is about, what MAPS Global is about, what we're doing here is training leaders. It's our conviction that God is interviewing men and women for positions of leadership and influence across the nations in the next 20 and 30 years. The Lord spoke to us clearly in moving down to Richmond a few years ago that we were to build an environment that would nurture and develop leaders. What does that mean? It means people that understand their influence and they're intentional that what grows up under their shade of influence is healthy things. What started to happen over the last year or so, I was actually, I was just down in Atlanta with my friend Billy Humphrey and his team, we're talking about this. What's happened for us, which is a new reality, is that leaders, pastors, ministry leaders, organizational leaders are starting to come here and sit and say, can you train us? Can you help us? Can you teach us how to build a culture? Can you cover us? Can I call you? They say, can I call you when I need something? I go, absolutely. We want MAPS Global to be a greenhouse and a covering for many different ministries and leaders and organizations. We want people, whether they come for a first Friday for two hours or whether they stay for 20 years a part of the family, when they leave, we want them to be better than when they came. We wanna be a greenhouse here. We want people to thrive. We want their families to thrive. We want their marriages to get better because they were in this priestly family. We want to disciple our children and our young adults to think like leaders in this generation, not just followers. I want our kids to grow up understanding that they have divine assignment that they have influence and they wanna give themselves to what matters. I tell my kids every day, and they're not just because they're pastor's kids. Every day I drop them off at school or the days that I get up early enough to drop them at school. Which is often. We pull up to their school, I said, I love you guys. I say, give yourself with excellence in everything you do today. Don't think like followers, think like leaders and let everyone see Jesus in your face. Goodbye, kiss, kiss. I want them to understand that they have influence. I want them to think like leaders. We need to train Gen Z not just to be followers, but to be leaders. I want them to grow up in this atmosphere, in this environment, and I want them to absorb a pioneering faith. I don't want them just to grow up thinking, I'll just do as, as, as little as I can to get by. I want our kids to grow up with pioneering faith. Going, how far can I go? How radical will you let me live? I wanna be a people that when God speaks to our 15 years old and 15 year old and sets them apart for the nations, they're around not just mom and dad, but they're around friends and family that go, yes, do it. Go for it. Not, uh, you, know, you know, grow up a little bit and we'll see what happens. No. I want them to grow up with pioneering faith in this environment. Leaders. I believe that the ideal context for discipleship or developing leaders is in the tent of meeting. It is in the presence of God. Our discipleship, our development has to become more God-centric than it is sin-centric. I'm giving, you all, I'm giving you all that I am right now. I'm opening the whole thing up to you. We've got to shift from, okay, let's just, let's just try to get Gen Z to stop sinning a little more to let's get Gen Z into the face of God. Exodus 33, 11, if you have this, put it up there. This is, this is my philosophy of discipleship. It says, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face. As a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again to go into the camp, he had 
responsibilities. He had a job. He had to administrate. He had to lead. His assistant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Two things about this. Number one, when God spoke to Moses face to face, someone was standing there watching. A young man was standing there watching how, to, how someone talks to God. Joshua learned leadership by watching Moses talk to God. Number two, when Moses had to go do responsibilities, he said, young man, stay here. God finds leaders in the tent of meeting. We're looking for giftedness and skill sets and personality types and who, you know, oh, you know, they got a little charisma. God's not looking for any of that. Trust me, he's not looking for any of that. God can do more with a surrendered heart, with a yes, than he can do with all kinds of giftedness and resources and opportunities and charisma and personality. We wanna create an environment where God finds the next generation of leaders staying in the tent of meeting. In the coming days, well, let me say this, we've trained hundreds. I think the number in our Frontier Mission School, it's, it's, uh, it's above 100, it's somewhere 125, 130, somewhere like that. Students have gone through our school in the last few years. <clears throat> and we're beginning to expand our, expand our training environments. In the last two years, we have crossed a threshold that 10 years ago was a dream. Oh, it would be a dream if we could do this, and now we're doing it. We're living the dream. We are running training schools, ministry training schools in unreached nations for indigenous leaders. This is incredible. In fact, in the, one of the nations, one of the countries in Eurasia that we're running our training school, it is, it is one of only two seminary level training schools in the entire country. In the entire country of 80 million people. And we're watching not just this environment produce leaders, we're watching our bases start to produce leaders. Greenhouses, we get to do this, let's go. And we wanna expand our training environments here at HQ. It's not just our Frontier Mission School students. We wanna train as many people as possible to walk in supernatural power, to minister to the Lord, to get excellent on instruments, to grow in their emotional maturity, to go deep in the scriptures. We wanna expand our training environment so that everyone gets trained. Training Thursdays have been a step in that direction. How many of you have been around for Training Thursdays? It's been awesome. Has it been awesome? Okay, good. And we wanna expand that. There are internships, there are music schools, there are things that are coming in the days ahead unto training leaders. Number three. Sending laborers. From this campus, in the next six years now, we are going to send, we are in the grace of God, we are gonna labor until we send at least 200 missionaries to the 1040 window. Our strength our resources, our prayer, even how we do relationships, how we do discipleship is unto Jesus getting the reward of his suffering. Right now there are 7,402 unreached people groups across the earth. That means nations, not countries, nations, people groups, tribes, families, languages, that have yet to have a viable witness of the gospel. Remember what we said about the gospel? What is it? It's powerful. And yet right now almost half the earth has not heard the gospel. It's particularly atrocious in my generation. I'm a millennial, don't hold that against me, but I'm a millennial. I played golf with a guy the other day in Atlanta and he goes, I just, I can't. Hand, I can't handle millennials, I just don't get on. I said, 
He said, I was playing with my best friend, Patrick, and we said, oh, you know, dude, I'm sorry, we're millennials. And he goes, well, you're the exception. I said, okay. <laughs> my generation, me, I'm 30, it'll be 37 in a month or two, month and a half. I was handed all the information needed. The 70s and 80s and 90s, they put, they did all the research for me. They identified every ethno-linguistic people group on the planet. That takes a lot of work. It's a lot of science. It's a lot of sociology. Then they gave me all of their names. And then they put, created a map and they put pins on the map where they are. That's what we inherited. So ignorance is not an excuse. I know their names, I know how many are, and I know where they are. Resources aren't an excuse. We have more money than we know what to do with in America. That's true, it's objectively true. I know you're trying to figure out how to fix your car, but zoom out for a minute. I felt you, you're like, oh yeah, I wish I had more money to do it. The fact that you're even thinking about how to fix your car puts you in the top 1% of the wealthiest people in the world. That's objectively true. Number three, we've got more, uh, more anointed young people than we know what to do with. There are not enough stages to put them on. This is a gift, the gift of God to this generation. Singers, preachers, musicians, we, we don't have enough stages in America. We don't have enough opportunities. Why? Because it's not for primarily for stages in America. It's for incense across the earth. There will be a generation that will cross off that last, the last name on that list of unreached people groups. That day is coming. Not because I, you know, I want it to happen and I have hope for it, because Jesus said it. Matthew 24, 14, it's in red, which means it's gonna happen. He said, this gospel, this glorious gospel of the kingdom will be, not maybe, not hopefully, not might be, that's a will be from the lips of the Son of God, will be proclaimed in the whole world as a witness to every ethnos, and then the end will come. The end will not come. Jesus will not return to the planet until every nation has had a chance to hear of his extreme mercy. It's an expression of his mercy. And I wanna say to the prayer movement, I know a lot of us didn't come out of that stream, but prayer movement at large, it's not, we, we're not just gonna sing back in the king, we have to preach back in the king. Out of those 7,402 people groups that are without a witness of the gospel, the vast majority of them, can you put up the map there if you could, the vast majority of them live in that box right there. It's called the 1040 window. For those of you who don't know, I'm trying to get everyone on the same page, which means that's the target. You go, where are we gonna send? We're gonna send into that box. Why? Because if I shoot an arrow into that box, I have a really high percentage chance of hitting a UPG. If I send it into Germany, there's some UPGs there, but for the most part. But if I send an arrow, if I send a team into that box, they're almost guaranteed to come face to face with people groups and nations that have never heard the gospel before. Now, look at that box. Does anything strike you about that box? What stands out to you? What's right in the middle of it? Huh? Israel in the Middle East, yeah, that's right. That box has about 3.1 billion Muslim people in it. But it also, if you go to the right side of the box, has two other cultures, Buddhism and Hinduism, India and then Central Asia. That box right there has three demonic prayer and worship cultures. 
that are creating a stronghold over the center of the earth. It's prayer and worship, unceasing, happening in that box to a foreign God. Therefore, God's strategy for the inbreaking of the gospel into that box is to raise up his house of prayer, to engage with powers and principalities, singers and musicians, intercessors that know how to deal with heaven so that they can, the gospel can deal with earth. When we say that we're, our aim is that box, what we mean is in a year ago, 2021, we published a seven year vision. We are aiming to plant across that box seven missions bases that are singing and praying night and day, preaching the gospel into the nations of the earth. Training schools, outreach, growing out of those places, their Antioch hubs into that region, all working together in this spiritual family towards Jesus getting his reward. Right now we have two and we're on our way to the third one, Eurasia mission space, our Middle East mission space. You see those three circles, those are our three environments, prayer, training, church, all together. We're aiming by 2028 to have a viable, a thriving, an anointed mission space in every one of those regions across the 1040 window. Let me read it to you. Eurasia, Middle East, North Africa. That's Egypt, Libya, Algeria, Morocco, East Africa, the Arab Gulf, the Himalayas, and the Levant, which includes Lebanon and Israel and the Gaza Strip, parts of Syria. Right now, we are on our way. We are in the process of planting our third base right now. By, the, by annual gathering next year, that team will be formed. And in, in the name of Jesus, help us, Lord. <laughs> the third one, the fourth one has been identified. The fifth one, I'm pretty sure I know where we're gonna be going. What you're gonna see in your, as you're in this environment and in this church family in the next three, four, five years is you're gonna see waves of people, families, children, going into these regions of the earth for the sake of the gospel. Prepare for the revolving door of anointed leaders. Number four, we are mobilizing for the Great Commission. I say it this way, we wanna make an annoying amount of noise about Jesus' commission. I want people to roll their eyes at me when I say Great Commission, because they've heard it so many times. I them, oh my God. Okay. I'm being a little facetious, but we want to make so much noise about it, and here's why. Because statistically, okay, this is not Randy's feeling it out prophetically, I've just got this hunch. 2018, the Barna Research Group did a survey of churchgoers in America. They interviewed churchgoers in America from across the spectrum, denominations, and they asked three questions. Have you ever heard of the Great Commission? Can you explain it? And do you know where it is in the Bible? 82% said, I don't know what it is. I've never heard of it, and I can't tell you where it is in the Bible. 82%. I got questions all over that. I go, they've been sitting in church pews and comfortable seats for 10 years and they've never once heard the phrase Great Commission? Then what are they here? I don't understand how any of us can understand our individual assignments apart from the mission we're in together. It makes no sense. So we decided we're gonna make a lot of noise about Jesus' commission because it is the assignment, the one assignment that all of us have in common. It's the preeminent assignment. It's the plumb line. Every other kingdom assignment is plumb line to one mission. Disciple the nations, preach the gospel, plant churches. Everything goes into that. 
No matter if your assignment is in this part or that part, you're either a goer, a sender, or you're disobedient. And I want a church family full of senders and goers and people that are on fire for Jesus, Jesus' name to be made great among the nations. The Great Commission needs to get us greatly uncomfortable. Now, here's what's happened. The reason I'm, I'm leaning into this, you're going, okay, man, here I, here's why. Bear with me for five, 10 more minutes and I'll give you the asks. This is what's happened in the last 10 years in America. First of all, in the last 10 years in America, there's been more mega churches that have been planted in the last 10 years than ever before in history. They qualify mega churches as over 2,000 people. In the same time span of the last 10 years, more mega churches that have been planted, there's been a 32% decrease in mission sending from America. That's a third. So mega church is going up, missionaries going down, and here's been the result. Over the last 10 years, unreached people groups, have not, we have not taken names off the list, they're adding names back onto the list. Because populations are growing, engagement's dropping, and now nations, peoples that were teetering on the edge of reach and are dropping into unreached categories. We're going in the wrong direction, guys. We're going in the wrong direction. We want to mobilize, when I say mobilize, make a lot of noise about Jesus' commission because the church is off track of her assignment. And most people are not even aware that there's a track to be on. We're off track, we're confused. The missiology is all over the place in terms of what we're supposed to be doing and how we're supposed to live. And we want to be crystal clear because Jesus and the apostles were crystal clear. You know, we just released our 100th episode of our Maps Global podcast. That was awesome. Can't believe we did 100 episodes. And I don't track these things closely at all. I probably should more, but I just don't. And so I, I told our team, I said, hey, just curious, how many people even listen to this thing? I I mean, we talk about the Great Commission, we talk about culture, we talk about like stuff that people are really heated about, trying to give some clarity to people. I said, just can you go back and just do the math? They came back and he said, you won't believe it. A hundred thousand people have listened to this podcast. A hundred thousand. I go, oh my gosh, we should probably be more, be, <laughs> I should think about what I'm gonna say a little bit more. A hundred thousand people have listened to that podcast. We want Gen Z. We want people in their retirement age, they're thinking about retiring. We want the Crate Commission to be right in the front of what the next 20 years looks like. We have moms and dads who are having kids. We want the Great Commission to be right in front of what, what it's gonna look like to raise our kids. Okay, number five. What are we doing here? We're building a family. A family that loves each other deeply we want to be a sticky family. We want people to come in and stick. I want people to come in and say, I came because of the mission and the vision, but I stayed because I was loved. In the next year, we're going to be taking substantial steps towards building out the pastoral care and ministries here at our local church expression. But I just wanna be really clear, for us at Maps Global, church is not a service we attend. Church is not a product we consume. Church is a dwelling place for God and a spiritual family that's living a life together that creates an atmosphere for that. Church is a people that have been all been adopted by the same father. They share the same blood, even though they were born in different places. And they join together to host the presence of God and to minister to people. God raises up leaders in the body of Christ. He raises up organizations to build families. God is not a CEO, he's a father.
We're not just to build brands. We're not just to build organizations. We're to build families. We ask ourselves many, many times, what are the people experiencing under this shade of influence? Are they learning to be a disciple of Jesus? Are they seeing obedience and integrity and honesty and transparency and zeal for good works in their leaders? I don't want to just, we don't want to just be influencers. We don't want to just be a pretty picture and a caption. I'm not going to be a pretty picture, but it was a pretty picture and a caption. We want to be in life together. Church is a family, and that's why we say MAPS Global is a family. That's not branding language for us. That's not marketing language. Ooh, if we call it a family, more people will like it. No, 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 no. It means that's how we see each other, and that's how we're building. The leadership here at MAPS Global, they feel they take responsibility for those under their leadership. Number five, or six, and again, I'm not adding a what for all of you in the room, and just want to say very clearly that this campus and this headquarters and what's happening at MAPS Global, what we're doing here is we are stewarding a healing anointing. There is an environment that's forming in our midst that's charged or faced with healing. It's a, it's a trickle now, but it's a trickle. And it will increase, and the healing rooms are coming. There is coming a day when people will step onto this campus and experience divine healing in their body before one, people, one person even gets to pray for them. There's coming a day when they'll get in their car to make the six hour trip and two hours in, they'll already get healed because of the faith that's connected to this place. There is coming a day and there is a day now where cancer is beginning to disappear in people's bodies in this place. That's not coming, that's happening. There's coming a day when demonic torment, when, when someone has, a, you know, when someone has a, an episode and a demonic torment and they lose their mind, people are gonna drag them into this room before they take them to the psych ward. We want Jesus' name to get so much fame because of the heal anointing, healing anointing that's resting in this place. We're gonna go after this together. So I wanted to say that clearly. Okay, here we are. Here's the five things I need for you. Are you ready? If you're gonna be a part of this family with us, if you go, that's my tribe, then I need these five things. We need these five things for you in order that we can move together, forward together. Number one, I need you to expand to five, three, five, these five things. You ready? Number one, I wanna ask you to expand your worship. Expand your worship. We need everyone to help keep the fire on the altar of the presence of God. And building towards that unbroken song and getting in that conversation with God that's never ending, that means we need everyone taking their place. Whether it's once a month or once a week or every day, we've gotta have ownership over this together, this prayer room. And so I wanna ask you to own your part in our liturgeo, our rhythm of life. And I wanna ask you, when you come into this environment, for the sake of the worth of Jesus and for the sake of others, come in with expectation that you're gonna give your all in worship. Now you're gonna come in and check out and see if they're singing on key today, and if they are, maybe I'll, no, come in and join the worship team. There is no stages in heaven. There are no stages in heaven. The team's up there for practical reasons alone. But we are together, the worship team. Expand your worship, come in and pour out your offering of praise. Take a place on the schedule. Number two, I wanna ask you, if you're part of this global family, MAPS is your tribe, to expand your giving through generous givers in the body of Christ, we have paid off all of the construction work in phase one here in the beautiful campus. That's a miracle. That's absolute miracle. In fact, if you can put up those numbers. Yeah, 
We raised, somebody gave us 500, half a million dollars to purchase this campus and the rest came in. And we've raised 538,000 to date to pay off all the work we've done here, our installation, our construction, our build out. That's incredible. Now what's happening is that there are multiple foundations and thousands of new partners that are getting on board with our global fund to fund these base, these base plants, to fund our current bases overseas. This is incredible. In fact, we've added, help me with this, we've added at least a thousand new partners in the last year. Thousand people going, I'm on board to see this 1040 window filled with incense. That's awesome, that's incredible. What we need is this spiritual family, this local family to take responsibility for headquarters. To say, you know what? I'm gonna take responsibility for that. A year ago when we were in Marshall Street, our monthly expenses, including rent and utilities, was approximately 12 to 15,000, somewhere in there, a month, which was awesome. That was great. With the purchase of this campus, that monthly expense has more than doubled. It's about, what is it, 35,000 a month for uh, mortgage, utilities, maintenance, it's a big place. What I'm asking you to do is expand your giving, take responsibility for headquarters so that we can continue to push for an unbroken song and bases across the 1040 window. Look at this, Romans 12. I was thinking about this. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches in his teaching. The one who exhorts in his exhortation. The one who contributes or gives in generosity. The one who leads with zeal. I can't come in here and, you know, maybe it'd be all right if we do this. No, we get to do this. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. What I'm asking for you, for those that are in our spiritual family, to contribute with generosity. I want to disciple a generous family. Not only it just covers the bills here, I want millions of dollars flowing in and out of this place for the sake of Jesus and his kingdom. The third ask, expand your relationships. The dynamic we have in the room is that some have been around for 10 years and some have been around for a month, which means there's a lot of relational work to do. And I'm gonna tell you this, in the next year, two years, three years, there will be hundreds more in this room. If you don't believe me, ask what I told my staff a year ago. I said, hey guys, in a year there'll be hundreds more and the number of community will outnumber staff. They went, ah, okay. A year later, oh my God. I'm telling you, let me just tell you, the magnet of the presence of God is in this place. We're gonna start building structure, pastoral structure, ministries around it here locally hundreds are gonna be added to the spiritual family in the next couple years, which means if you've been here for a month right now, you're gonna be an OG. (laughs) Yeah, which means I need your help to translate to them what we're doing and why we're doing it, because it's weird. How many of you showed up and you're like, I can't figure it out? (laughs) It's weird, right? He's like, wow. I need your help. I need you to be translators with me. We can't just depend on Randy to communicate to every single person about where they belong here. I need your help. I need your help to create a warm and loving atmosphere and environment for people when they walk in. I want them to get 10 high fives, hugs, and hellos before they even get into the room. I want you to be able to translate our culture, expand your relationships, get into living rooms, Go get coffee, hang out, spend time, get into people's lives. Number four, I wanna ask you to expand your faith. We are a pioneering movement, which means we are gonna be pushing the boundaries for the next, till Jesus comes, but definitely in the next seven years, six years. We're gonna be pushing on this. There's gonna be, things, there's gonna be times where we're going, church, we're gonna go for this. And I wanna challenge you now to begin to work that muscle of pioneering faith. Say, Lord, speak to me. Lord, expand my faith about this sending center on the East Coast, about seven bases in the 1040 window, about an atmosphere here in Richmond that can host the glory of God. Ask the Lord to give you a vision for that so that we come in with faith. And the last ask, 
for you that we have is to expand your ownership. Expand your ownership. I am not interested in a hundred or two observers watching a few people do ministry. Ugh. Oh, I want to quit now if that happens. Ugh. We want hundreds of people that feel ownership of where it's happening and equipped to do ministry. So if you see a need, fill it. Find your place. Give your best to serve. Whether it's living rooms and pr- or the prayer room, we need everyone that says, this is my tribe. I need everyone. We need everyone's help to move forward. So get in the game on this. No spectators, no sidelines. Everyone's in the game. Amen? All right, let's stand together. We did it. Ministry team can come up. We're gonna dismiss because we need to get our kids. But we'll open it up for prayer. What I wanna do is ask the Lord for grace for every family, every man and woman, child in this, this place for grace to be plugged in, to find their place. All the puzzle pieces fit together to make the beautiful picture. Ministry team, come up. Richard, you did such a great job in worship today, by the way. It was really beautiful. Okay, let's pray. Father, Lord, we ask you for grace, grace, grace to be upon this family. Lord, for those that are running with assignments in the marketplace or in education, Lord, grace to find their place in the spiritual family. Lord, for those that are at home raising the kids and making dinner, grace, grace, grace to find their place in the spiritual family. Lord, I bless every assignment that's represented in this room, and I ask you now that you would begin to bind us together into a spiritual force or that carries your name to the nations of the earth, carries your name to the neighborhoods in Richmond and the nations of the earth. Lord, in the coming days, would you speak clearly for those that need to make transitions? I just been feeling, by the way, just prophetically, I, don't, I didn't want to get into it because I didn't want to have the pastor at all, but some of you are in transition, <laughs> so there it is. And Lord, grace for transition. Some of you know you, you're, you're on the cusp, you need, you're making a change, and I saw even some that... Even the location of where you live is changing. So there it is. Maybe that's confirmation for someone. But Lord, grace over the transitions. Grace over the process. And Lord, I ask you for that anointing to come upon us to build unceasing worship. For the grace to train leaders in the next generation. Lord, to give our hearts to sin laborers. Lord, to mobilize and make noise about your commission, Jesus. Grace to build family. Lord, and grace to steward the healing anointing that you've released. Lord, we stand before you today as we end and we ask you, be it unto us according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.